Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we're discussing the acute inflammatory response and uh, the anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so in this next video, what we're going to talk about is the glucocorticoids, which is a very powerful um, family of drugs, which are both anti-inflammatories and also immunosuppressants. Now, we're only going to look at their um, anti-inflammatory effects, but it's worth noting that uh, they are an example of a drug which has both anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive effects. Okay, so, uh, firstly, let's go over some of the examples of glucocorticoids. Okay, so, uh, a very famous example is the drug hydrocortisone. Okay, now this is actually the same thing as cortisol, okay? So hydrocortisone is the same thing as cortisol. Um, hydrocortisone is the name of the drug that we use, basically. Uh, if you are prescribed it, it will be called hydrocortisone rather than cortisol. When your adrenal glands make it naturally, it's called cortisol, but they can be used interchangeably. Hydrocortisone and cortisol are the same thing. Okay, um, another example of a glucocorticoid uh, is prednisone. Okay, now prednisone is not an active drug, it's what is known as the pro drug. Okay, so it's what would be given to someone. However, it to actually have an effect within the body, it needs to be metabolized within the liver. So it's going to be metabolized within the liver and it's going to be converted into the active drug, which is known as prednisolone. Okay, so this is the active drug. Okay, and then prednisolone is going to um, go and have the glucocorticoid effect. So hydrocortisone is an active drug, so it doesn't need to be activated. Prednisolone is now the active drug. Okay, another example of a glucocorticoid is a, a drug known as triamcinolone. Okay, so this is triamcinolone. And then finally, another famous example is dexamethasone. Okay, so four examples there. Uh, hydrocortisone, prednisone, uh, which has to be activated to prednisolone, uh, triamcinolone, and dexamethasone. Right, so what do these drugs do? Well, basically, they are going to go into cells, and I'm going to outline this pathway um, for all cells. And then we'll see what actually uh, this is going to have, uh, how this is going to affect the different cells in the um, inflammatory response to cause an overall uh, anti-inflammatory effect. Okay, so basically these drugs are going to go into cells and they're going to bind to and activate something known as the glucocorticoid receptor alpha. Okay, so here it is. At the glucocorticoid receptor alpha, often abbreviated to the GCR alpha. Okay, so this here, its full name is the glucocorticoid receptor alpha. Okay, now usually the glucocorticoid receptor alpha is within the cytoplasm of cells, and it also has uh, another protein bound to it. Okay, now this other protein is something known as heat shock protein 90 or HSP90. So HSP90 is short for heat shock protein 90. Okay, so in the cytoplasm of your cells, you have glucocorticoid receptor alpha bound to heat shock protein 90. Now what's going to happen is that uh, the glucocorticoid, whether it's hydrocortisone, prednisolone, triamcinolone, or dexamethasone, is going to come and bind to the glucocorticoid receptor alpha, and when it does, that will cause the heat shock protein 90 to dissociate off from the glucocorticoid receptor alpha. Okay, so here we now have our glucocorticoid receptor alpha, our GCR alpha here, with our glucocorticoid bound to it there. So we'll colour our glucocorticoid in. So we'll have it in blue here. 
And what then happens is it dimerizes with another one which has also uh, got a uh, glucocorticoid bound to it. So here is another free glucocorticoid receptor alpha. So this is a glucocorticoid receptor alpha. And again, it's got a glucocorticoid molecule bound to it. So when they, when they have um, heat shock protein 90 bound to them, they cannot dimerize. But once the heat shock 90 protein has been uh, moved off because the glucocorticoid is bound, they can then dimerize. Now, this complex here will move into the nucleus of the cell and is going to act as a transcription factor. Okay, so it will bind to promoter regions and alter uh, the likelihood that that downstream gene is going to be transcribed uh, and therefore will express the, um, well, will alter the expression levels of that uh, gene's gene product. Okay, right, so which genes are they going to alter? Okay, so for this, let's go to the specific cells and see how uh, the genes that this is going to affect is going to have an effect. So, let's go back to the very start of the acute inflammatory response. Now, where am I? I need the piece of paper. Ah, here we go. So, the very starting point is that these dendritic cells and resident macrophages need to start producing interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha in response to their pattern recognition receptors being activated by the PAMPs, okay? The mast cells also need to release histamine, but we can't really do anything about that because um, the mast cells already have the histamine there, whereas these dendritic cells and resident macrophages, they actually have to produce the interleukin-1 and the tumor necrosis factor alpha. So, if we can stop them producing interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, that will have a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect, and that is what these drugs actually do. So, the glucocorticoid receptor alpha dimer is going to decrease the expression level of interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So it's going to stop these two genes being expressed. It's going to go bind to the promoter regions of the interleukin-1 gene and the tumor necrosis factor alpha gene and stop RNA polymerase from being able to bind there. So it will act as a transcriptional repressor for these two proteins. Okay, now it will do this in all cells, but it's only going to be important in those cells which actually are making this. And the cells which were making it uh, were these initial sentinel cells. So these um, resident macrophages and dendritic cells. So if you stop or at least reduce this production of interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha, you're going to hugely reduce type 2 activation. And of course, we know type 2 activation is the real, um, you know, it does it properly, whereas type 1 activation is kind of like the first attempt, but it needs to be corrected by type 2 activation. And if you don't get that uh, increased vigor of type 2 activation, then your acute inflammatory response will be hugely reduced. Okay, so that's one way uh, that the glucocorticoid receptor alpha is going to um, decrease the acute inflammatory response. Okay, uh, the next thing is that it's also going to lead to an increase in the production of inhibitor of NF-kappa B proteins. Okay, so the inhibitor of NF-kappa B proteins will go up. Now, where have we seen the inhibitor of NF-kappa B proteins? Well, we saw this protein in a type 2 activation of our endothelial cells. Okay, so remember what happened was in order to get type 2 activation, you had to remove the inhibitor of NF-kappa B protein from the NF-kappa B transcription factor, this P50 and P65. So, the way that tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-1 caused uh, type 2 activation of endothelial cells was that they activated the nuclear factor kappa B, okay, by inactivating this inhibitor of the nuclear factor kappa B. So if we can produce more of this, then 
even if uh, the tumor necrosis factor alpha and the interleukin-1 are stimulating their receptors and leading to the degradation of the inhibitor of kappa B, if we're making enough to replace the amount that's being lost, then it will just remain bound to the NF-kappa B, and therefore you won't get the activation of NF-kappa B. So you will stop type 2 activation again. And this is one of the effects of these uh, glucocorticoid receptor alpha dimers, that it's going to increase the expression level of uh, the inhibitor of NF-kappa B. Okay, in addition, you're also going to get repression of the expression of cyclooxygenase 2. So both of these are very important in endothelial cells. You've increased your production of inhibitor of NF-kappa B within endothelial cells, which is stopping um, the uh, activation of NF-kappa B within these endothelial cells, and therefore is going to stop type 2 activation within the endothelial cells, and therefore hugely reduce the acute inflammatory response. Now, also, you're inhibiting uh, the production of cyclooxygenase 2, okay, uh, which will mean uh, that the amount of prostacyclin that you're going to produce, even if uh, you have type 2 activation, is going to be reduced. And therefore, again, that's going to reduce the acute inflammatory response. Finally, one last little uh, effect that I want to talk about is that you're going to increase the expression of a protein known as lipocortin 1, also known as annexin A1. So it has two names, lipocortin-1 and annexin A1, and you'll hear both still used, which is why I'm stressing the two of them. And it's going to increase the expression of lipocortin-1. Now, what does lipocortin-1 do? Well, basically, this is a protein which is going to inhibit the cellular phospholipase A2. So remember, in type 1 activation, what happens is the increase in the level of calcium within the cytoplasm of the endothelial cell causes the activation of cellular phospholipase A2, which then goes to the membrane and starts breaking down phosphatidylcholine into lysophosphatidylcholine and arachidonic acid. And this produces the arachidonic acid, which the cyclooxygenase enzymes uh, use uh, to produce uh, prostaglandin H2, which is then used by prostacycline synthase to make prostacycline, which causes vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles, leading to the infected area and causes increased blood flow, leading to redness and hotness. Okay, well, basically, annexin A1, or lipocortin 1, okay, so we'll call this annexin A1, to mix ourselves between the two names. So here's annexin A1. It's going to go and inhibit this cellular phospholipase A2 enzyme, and therefore it's going to stop the production of arachidonic acid within these endothelial cells, and therefore stop the production of uh, prostacycline, and therefore stop the increase in vasodilatation and the increase in uh, blood flow that that causes. So overall, glucocorticoids have a huge number of effects which cause uh, the, a reduction in the acute inflammatory response. So they reduce the production of tumor necrosis factor alpha and interleukin-1, which remember are these initial cries for help from these uh, resident macrophages and dendritic cells. They also uh, increase the production of inhibitor of NF-kappa B within the endothelial cells, and this prevents uh, the type 2 activation of those endothelial cells, uh, because you need NF-kappa B for that to occur. And if you've got the inhibitor of NF-kappa B too high, then you're not going to get activation of NF-kappa B. You also stop the production of cyclooxygenase 2, which reduces the production of prostacycline and therefore produce, reduces uh, the vasodilatation and increased blood flow that you see in the acute inflammatory response. And finally, you also make this annexin A1 or lipocortin 1, which is going to stop the production of arachidonic acid in type 1 activated endothelial cells and therefore stop the production of prostacycline, which comes from that arachidonic acid. Okay, so that's how glucocorticoids such as hydrocortisone, uh, prednisolone, uh, triamcinolone, and dexamethasone uh, work to have a very powerful anti-inflammatory effect.
but they do also have numerous side effects because these are steroid drugs, okay? And these are really what you're contrasting the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs to, um, such as uh, aspirin and ibuprofen.